Chapter 4 of The Adventures of Poor Mrs. Quack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Poor Mrs. Quack by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 4 Mrs. Quack Continues Her Story When Mrs. Quack told of her twelve children and how she didn't know where one of them was, Peter Rabbit and Jerry Muskrat knew just how badly she was feeling, and they turned their heads away and pretended that they didn't see her tears. In a few minutes she bravely went on with her story. When Jack Frost came, and we knew it was time to begin the long journey, Mr. Quack and myself and our twelve children joined with some other duck families, and with Mr. Quack in the lead, we started for our winter home, which really isn't a home, but just a place to stay. For a while, we had nothing much to fear. We would fly by day and at night rest in some quiet lake or pond or on some river with the great woods all about us or sometimes great marshes. Perhaps you don't know what marshes are. If the green meadows here had little streams of water running every which way through them and the ground was all soft and muddy and full of water and the grass grew tall, they would be marshes. Jerry's muskrat's eyes sparkled. I would like a place like that, he exclaimed. You certainly would, replied Mrs. Quack. We always find lots of our relatives in such places. Marshes must be something like swamps, ventured Peter Rabbit, who had been thinking the matter over. Very much the same, only with grasses and rushes in place of trees and bushes, replied Mrs. Quack. There is plenty to eat and the loveliest hiding places. In some of these, we stayed days at a time. In fact, we stayed until Jack Frost came to drive us out. Then as we flew, we began to see homes of these terrible two-legged creatures called men. And from that time on, we never knew a minute of peace, except when we were flying high in the air or far out over the water. If we could have just kept flying all the time or never had to go near the shore, we would have been all right, but we had to eat. Of course, said Peter, everyone has to eat. And we had to rest, said Mrs. Quack. Certainly, said Peter, everyone has to do that. And to eat, we had to go in close to shore where the water was not deep at all because it is only in such places that we can get food, continued Mrs. Quack. It takes a lot of strength to fly as we fly, and strength requires a lot of food. Mr. Quack knew all the best feeding places, for he had made the long journey several times, so every day he would lead the way to one of these. He always chose the wildest and most lonely-looking places he could find as far as possible from the homes of men, but even then he was never careless. He would lead us around back and forth over the place he had chosen, and we would look with all of our might for signs of danger. If we saw none, we would drop down a little nearer and a little nearer, but with all our watchfulness, we never could be sure, absolutely sure, that it was safe. Sometimes those terrible two-legged creatures would be hiding in the very middle of the wildest, most lonely-looking marshes. They would be covered with grass so that we couldn't see them. Then, as we flew over them, would come the bang, 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 bang of the terrible guns, and always some of our flock would drop. We would have to leave them behind, for we knew if we wanted to live, we must get beyond the reach of those terrible guns. So we would fly our hardest. It was awful, just simply awful. Mrs. Quack paused and shuddered. 
and Peter Rabbit and Jerry Muskrat shuddered in sympathy. Sometimes we would have to try three or four feeding places before we found one where there was no terrible guns, and when we did find one, we would be so tired and frightened that we couldn't enjoy our food, and we didn't dare sleep without someone on watch all the time. It was like that every day. The further we got, the worse it became. Our flock grew smaller and smaller. Those who escaped the terrible guns would be so frightened that they would forget to follow their leader and would fly in different directions and perhaps join other flocks. So it was that when at last we reached the place in the sunny Southland for which we had started, Mr. Quack and I were alone. What became of our twelve children? I don't know. I'm afraid the terrible guns killed some. I hope some joined other flocks and escaped but I don't know. I hope they did too, said Peter. End of chapter 4